This program is a presentation of University of California Television. Your support makes UCTV's programming possible. Contribute online at uctv.tv slash support. Check out our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash uctv prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Lindsay Hilsom, who is the international editor for Britain's Channel 4 News. Her new book is Sandstorm uh, with Libya in the Time of Revolution. Welcome to Berkeley. Thank you very much. Lovely to be here. Where were you born and raised? Oh, I was born in a small town in England called Malvern in the countryside, but then um, I moved to London later. And looking back, how did your parents shape your thinking about the world? Well, I think that my mother in particular had a very strong sense of, of justice and also what was going on internationally. She was very involved in the local Oxfam group, you know, caring about development um, overseas. And um, I think that they, they brought me up with a conscience and also to be intensely curious about the world. And was there much conversation around the dinner table about world events? Yes, one of, one of the memories I have is being in the back of a car with um, a friend when I was a kid. And um, I said, oh, I don't believe in God. And I can remember the father who was driving the car saying, I don't want that kind of talk in my car. <laughs> and I had no understanding of what I'd done wrong because all of these issues were discussed all the time at home. Mm -hmm. and, and what was the influence of your father? Well, my father is a scientist. And, um, you, you know, he was... He also, I would say, had a, had a great conscience. But I think that what was the important thing about him was he... It was, you know, the bringing us up, my sister and I, to think about things, to be rigorous in our thinking. And I was never a scientist, but I got something from that method of thought. Where were you educated? I went to a girls' grammar school, which is what you would call a, a public school, and to uh, the University of Exeter in Britain. And what did you major in? I studied languages, Spanish and French. Uh huh. And what led you to journalism? Well. In my second year at university, normally what uh, students did was go to either France or Spain to teach English. And I thought that was really boring. And I wanted to go to Latin America, which is obviously, if you're here in California, that's a, an obvious thing mm. to do. But in Britain, it's not an obvious thing to do. And so I started writing off to anybody I could think of in Latin America who might give me a volunteer job. And um, I managed to get a job with, with Oxfam, the, the aid agency in Guatemala. And I say job, it was a volunteer position. And they said, well, if you can make your way out here, um, we'll make sure you don't starve. So I worked as a waitress and I got my airfare and I went to Guatemala. And, um, and then, you know, I was supposed to be an administrator in this and that. I was rubbish at that. But what I was okay at was going off to projects and talking to people and finding out what was going on. That was journalism, really. And, but then, was that the point at which you got interested in human rights? Maybe? Yes, I became very interested. It was, this, we're talking about the late 70s. It's the time of the wars in Central America. Those you know, appalling human rights abuses were going on in, in Guatemala, in, in Nicaragua, in Mexico, El Salvador, and so on. So I, I got very involved in, in all of that. And so, but at what point did you officially become a journalist? Well, what happened then was um, I tried to be a journalist. I went to Mexico City. Uh, I tried to launch myself as a freelance. I didn't do badly. But then I got a, another volunteer position as an information officer with the UN's Children's Fund. And this one was in East Africa, in Nairobi. So I did that for three years. And I was writing under a pseudonym. And then, um, then I became a fully-fledged journalist. After that, I stayed on in, in Africa, in Nairobi, and I became a stringer for The Guardian and the BBC. Was, was traveling just in your genes? I don't know. I just, you know, right from the beginning, I can remember when I first got to Guatemala, uh, waking up one morning and thinking, 
I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. This mm -hmm. is it. I've found it. And in a sense, I have done. Uh, I like to ask my guests what skills and temperament are involved in what they do. Uh, students watch this program. What, what do you think it, it uh, takes to be a, uh, uh, a war correspondent? Well, I wouldn't say that I have a lot of skills. I would say that I can, I can read, I can write, I can ask questions, I can do it in a couple of languages. Um, but I actually, it's very different these days. I have no technical skills. These days, anybody going into journalism has to be able to shoot and edit and, you know, do all of the technical side, whereas I'm old enough that, you know, I have a, a camera operator who I work with and, and so on. But in terms of temperament, I suppose you have to be endlessly curious and you have to, you have to really care. I think if you don't care, why would you bother? I mean, for me, the issue is the human story. The issue is what people endure during war. I want to know about that. And if you don't care about that, I'm not sure why you would go through the, the personal risk at all. But for me, that's what's really important. And I suppose the other thing is just, you know, I want to be where history is happening. If something is going on, there's a revolution in Libya, why would I want to be anywhere else but Libya? That's the place I want to be. And, and what about courage? I mean, is, is it, do, you, do you worry about uh, the bullets flying or are you so committed to, to caring and, and being where history is made? No, I get scared. I'm a perfectly normal human being. I get scared. And you make your judgments. And, you know, most of the time I'm doing television news. And what you do is you, you go into the where the bullets are flying for as short a time as possible to get what you need in terms of interviews, in terms of footage, in terms of understanding what's going on. And then you get out again. So I try to expose myself and my team to uh, as little danger as possible. But the fact of the matter is you have to expose yourself to, to some danger. And, of course, one of the issues that we have now is that I think it's getting more dangerous. I think it's more dangerous now than it was when, when I started off. And that's because every guerrilla commander or every um, government, they can see what's on satellite television. They know what we're doing. They know we're trying to uncover the human rights abuse that they commit. And so sometimes they want to get rid of us to silence us. Uh, you must have been part of uh, the, the, the wave of women who entered journalism after the, the women's liberation movement. I mean, they were distinguished women individual correspondents before. Talk a little about that. Was, was it difficult in the 70s to be a woman in these places? Well, it was really the 80s when I started. And you know, I didn't really think about it that much to begin with. I mean, this was what I wanted to do. And, uh, and so I did it. And it wasn't until a bit later on when I suppose I became a bit more ambitious um, about not just being a stringer and wanting a correspondent's job and finding there were a lot of, of blocks, certainly when I worked for the BBC in the 80s as they were blocks. And so I thought, oh, stuff it. And I just went freelance again and did my, did my own thing. But it's, it's quite interesting that there's a sort of new fuss which is being made about female war correspondents at the moment. I, I'm, begin, I'm beginning to feel like a newly discovered species, you know. <laughs> and I feel like I say, well, you know, we have been around quite, quite a, a while. And I don't, on the whole, think that the way we report is particularly different from the may, way men report. And I don't think that the dangers we face are, on the whole, particularly difficult. I mean, you know, it's difficult to talk about. One of my best friends has just been killed, Marie Colvin. She was, she was one of my closest friends. Um, the shell that killed her killed a French photographer called Romy Oschlick. It didn't distinguish whether who was a man and who was a woman. Uh, you have covered, you know, uh, the, the, all the major conflicts uh, with the end of the Cold War. You were in Kosovo. You were in Afghanistan. Uh, you've been in Iran. You've covered the Israeli-Palestine conflict and the Rwandan genocide, and now and now Libya. And and is that just because that's where the stories were? Uh, and 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 I'm curious, what are, are there ethical dilemmas in in terms of covering this? Because on the one hand, you are telling the story that. Uh, raises the level of the world's conscience mm -hmm. that says terrible things are going on here 
you know, should we intervene? You're not arguing for intervention, you know. But then, on the other hand, there are consequences to intervention. So it, it seems like a, a very interesting ethical dilemma. Do you worry about that, or you just want to get that story? Well, I think that there's a limit to how much I can worry about it. I mean, I have ethical dilemmas all the time. I mean, my ethical dilemmas are, are quite often to do with the relationship that I, as a journalist, have with the people I'm interviewing. And one of the most difficult things is, you know, when people really believe that by talking to me, it's going to make a change to their situation. Um, and on the whole, I don't think it is. But mm. I, I, I believe in information. I believe it's better to know than not to know. If you look at Syria now, I don't have a simple answer for what we should do, for what whether outside intervention would work or not work. I don't know the answer. But I do know that it's terribly important that we should know that children are being killed, that massacres are being committed. And they try and stop us. They don't want us to find out. They don't want us to tell the story. My job is to tell the story. What happens after that, what the politicians decide, I can't I can't, in a sense, I can't directly influence that. All I can make, I can do is make sure that the information I provide is as truthful as possible. Mm -hmm. So what led you uh, to write the book? Because as uh, an editor on a television news program, it, it's a... It's a different uh, platform. Yeah, well, I'm an editor as a correspondent. I mean, I'm a correspondent. I'm out there the whole, the whole time. Um, I think it was, you know... I, I've, I've always wanted to write a book, and um, you know there's at least four absolutely brilliant books that I haven't written. You know they <laughs> were ab they right. were superb those books mm -hmm. I never got mm -hmm. round to writing, um, and I was really getting quite tired of myself saying, mm -hmm. "Oh, I'm going to write a book," and never getting round to it. And the thing about Libya, it was partly because um, when I got there, I really liked the people. I found the people very funny. I, and I found them very easy mm. to talk to. And also because I hit that moment when people were telling their stories for the first time. In the four decades of Gaddafi's rule, people had not been able to speak to outsiders. And so suddenly I was there in this very privileged uh, position. And because I was there from the, at the beginning of the revolution, and I mean, I went backwards and forwards, but I, I saw it all the way through. So I felt I had a, I had a complete story. And so the, this was one that I could tell. And also, you know, I couldn't find any good books on Libya. Mm. Ever I looked, I couldn't find a good book on Libya, so I thought, damn, I suppose I'd better write it. Mm -hmm. And, and what, what, what is the difference between the reporting, you know, using television crews versus writing a book? Well, the, the difference is time. You know, that I went back, um, when I started to write the book, I went back to re-interview uh, some of the people who I had met while doing the television reporting. Well, the problem with doing television or any kind of news reporting is you're quickly in and out. And so, you know, you meet someone, you get a bit of a snippet of their story, and then you're rushing off to file your report for that night. And the joy of writing the book was, you know, I went back and found the, those people and sat down with them and spent hours with them and went into their whole backstory and, and met their husbands and wives and learned how other people thought about them and looked at them and so on. And that gave me so much a, a fuller picture and it meant that I could understand them and I could understand Libya so much better. And, and one of the skills that we didn't talk about before is just listening, right? Yeah, I mean, that must really be important because your book has about um, maybe as many as 15 or 20 narratives of individuals and, and their lives during the regime and during the revolution. Yeah, there are six main ones who, you know, I, I take through uh, throughout. And I, for me, it was very important to do this book through the eyes of the Libyans I met. I mean, there's some first-hand reporting on what I saw and so on, but for me, what was interesting was how it looked and felt and smelt to the Libyans, the people who were really involved and really connected with it. And, you know, their stories were so absorbing. The listening, I mean, you know, I could listen to them for hours because those stories are compelling. Mm -hmm. Now, let, let's walk through the, 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 the pieces of your book. The, the first thing is Gaddafi and his rule. Uh, how did he, how many years did he last and, and how did he do that? Well, when Gaddafi came to power, which was in 1969, he was very popular. Uh, the king, King Idris, who had, uh, they called him the reluctant monarch, and he was in charge at the time. And he basically, he didn't do much. And so Libya was falling behind, and Libyans were looking around at the rest of North Africa and the Arab world and, and felt that they were just being left behind by history. 
So when this handsome young army officer seized power with his, uh, his com revolutionary committee, I think people were excited. And one of the things that I have in the book is, a, is an archive of photographs which were found in the uh, abandoned government buildings after Gaddafi fell. And you see him there, you know, with his clear skin and his thick eyebrows and his smart army uniform. But then he became autocratic very quickly. And he became brutal very quickly. And he developed his own political philosophy. And anyone who went against it, well, you know, they'd erect a gallows in the street or on the university campus, and people would hang. So the first way he kept power was through brutality. And the second way he kept power was through confusion. Were, he did not believe in a proper, what you would call a proper government, or even really in any institutions of state. So you would have an institution like, for example, the foreign ministry with a foreign minister. But that foreign minister might be you know, working on some policy, let's say, with regard to a neighboring country like Chad. And then he'd wake up and find out that um, Gaddafi's brother-in-law was in Chad, working on a completely different policy. And so he kept everybody guessing. And no, he kept all the balls in the air. And nobody but Gaddafi knew what was really going down. And, and he, he in, in 40 years of not having a state, he would use committees. Uh, explain that, the, the uh, Lejean Tari? Lejean Tari, the, the yeah. revolutionary committees. What, what were they? And, and well, Gaddafi had this theory, which he developed in his Green Book, which was, he, called his, he called the state the Jamahiriya, which means the state of the masses. And so the myth was that the people, the Libyan people, were in charge. It was nonsense. Gaddafi was in charge. But then, so from within the people, you had these revolutionary committees. You know, they were basically the neighborhood thugs. And they were a law unto themselves because they were licensed by Gaddafi. And so the revolutionary committees were the people who were the ones who kept people in order in neighborhoods. But then they had another role. For example, when Gaddafi, um, he had a, a sort of socialist uh, economic policy, and that involved uh, nationalization and taking over all the sort of assets. But also, for example, the National Maritime Organization, which was involved in shipping oil and so on. The revolutionary committees were sent in to organize that, that they were now in charge. So instead of having professionals in charge, you had the revolutionary committees. And I have one story in the book of a a man who had been, he was in the Navy, and then he was, um, he, he was on board ship. And he remembers when the revolutionary committees came in. And uh, the, the guy said, well, which way does the, the ship go? He, he didn't know the front from the back of the ship. Mm -hmm. And he was the one who was in charge. Mm -hmm. you, you have a fascinating description of uh, the implications of his rule, not, not obviously the, the, the victimization of the people and, and the terror that was conducted. We'll talk about that in a minute. But in not having a state, it led the people to turn to tribe and family. And, and you point out that, so therefore, the way the system worked was, if you were getting screwed by one of these committee, you might have a tribal or family member who was involved on the government side, even though there was no yeah. government, and they would intervene for you. So there was this, this strange interplay between no state and the emphasis on tribe and family. Well, that's right. And you had a system of, of patronage as well. But basically, you know, one of the things that's happening in Libya now is that people accuse each other of collaborating with Gaddafi. But you know what? People didn't have a lot of choice. If someone is in power for 42 years, then you have to collaborate or cooperate to some extent. Otherwise, you can't get anything done. And people need jobs. They need money. They need a house. They need to survive. And so, Quite, uh, you know, and, and people would get jobs based on whether they were loyal or not. And so it was very difficult for people to make those decisions. But if you were from a, a clan which was seen as totally the enemy, it was very hard for your people, for your family, um, to survive at all. And so people made those kind of compromises. But in the end, their loyalty was to their family because it was only the family who they could really trust. Mm -hmm. Now, now. The trajectory of Gaddafi's relations uh, with the world is, is really fascinating. So in the beginning, he comes in and he, 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 he stands up to the oil companies and is one of the first one to change the price structure and the ownership structure. 
Absolutely. He played this enormous role in history because he realized that, um, that oil-producing countries were just not getting what they should get from oil and that all the money was going to, you know, to Esso or British Petroleum or, or whoever. And he realized that they had huge leverage that they weren't using. And so he was the first one to say, right, we're going to change this. You know, I, I demand more money and then I demand a 51 percent share in the company and so on. And so he did that. And they caved. They had no choice but to cave. And that was at the beginning of the 70s. And then you, you had the, you know, the Arab-Israeli conflict in 1973 um, and the oil boycott, which had then boosted the price more. But Gaddafi has his place in history there for changing the balance of power in the relationships between oil producers and oil consumers. And, and, but he also then used the wealth that was generated to become really, uh, if not not an organizer, but uh, a facilitator of terrorism worldwide. Well, he saw himself as anti-imperialist, anti-colonialist, anti-fascist. But he had, how shall I put it, eclectic tastes in rebel movements and so on. So on the one hand, he supported the ANC, the African National Congress. You know, Nelson Mandela was, a, you know, was a friend, or became a friend, because he supported them so much. He supported the, the Palestinian cause. He thought that he was really the only Arab leader who truly supported the Palestinian cause. Actually, he did an awful lot of meddling between Palestinian factions, and Yasser Arafat absolutely loathed him. But he also picked various um, quarrels or rebel groups across Africa. And he had a training center where these people would come. Now, amongst the people who trained in what was called the Mathaba, the center in Benghazi, was Charles Taylor of Liberia. Who has just been convicted. Just been convicted of war crimes, sentenced to 50 years in prison. Fode Sanko, who was the rebel leader in, uh, in Sierra Leone, famed for the rape of little girls and the chopping off of people's arms and legs in the conflict there. Gaddafi was behind a lot of those wars in, uh, in West Africa, as well as Oh, all sorts of things that are long, long forgotten, you know. Well, um, the IRA in Britain, the Irish Republican Army, blowing up um, civilians in, on the British mainland and soldiers in, in Northern Ireland. He armed them. And also he organized killing teams that uh, would attack, immigrate, kill the, the immigrants, but also he, he turned on uh, the West uh, after, in, in retaliation for the alleged killing of his daughter. Well, there were two things here. I mean, the first was the stray, what they called the stray dogs policy. And the stray dogs were his opponents who'd gone into exile. Because obviously, as life became harder in Libya for anybody who opposed him, people, Libyans went off and they lived in Italy and Britain and America and, and plotted against him and tried to, to overthrow him. So he had this policy of, of just taking them out. And, and revolutionary committee members would be sent, sometimes under the guise of being diplomats or sometimes just under the guise of being normal people. And there were there were shootings, there were poisonings, there were quite a lot in in, in London. London was a was a centre um, for that. Uh, and, and then talk about the Lockerbie uh, bombing. Well, we, we still don't know who did that in, within Libya, right? Well, I think you know. I think that there's more to come out on Lockerbie. And obviously, there's some people who still believe that it was not. Uh, Libya. They believe that it was uh, the bombing was carried out by maybe the Syrians or the Iranians, and so we, you know we're still not 100% sure. Most of the Libyans I know in the new government and so on say it was Libya, but I don't think anybody believes that Abdul Basid al Magrahi, who was the one man who was convicted of the Lockerbie bombing, was acting alone. He was recruited, it seems, to the uh, the Libyan intelligence agency, and we know he worked for the Libyan intelligence agency, by Abdullah al Sanusi. Um, Sanusi was Gaddafi's brother-in-law. He's from the same tribe as uh, Magrahi, and he was at the time, I'm told, in charge of special operations. So then there is the question of whether Sanusi ordered um, the Lockerbie bombing as retaliation for Ronald Reagan's bombing of Colonel Gaddafi's Bab al Aziz uh, compound in 1986. Now, Sanusi is the one who knows. Sanusi, recently in March, was captured in Mauritania. He was fleeing. He was free, had been in Morocco. He was traveling on a fake Malian passport. And he was captured, and the French were interrogating him. And I would imagine that the Americans are also interrogating him. So he's the man who knows. Will we ever find out? Watch this space. <laughs> uh, uh, it's fascinating when you look at the trajectory of the West's relationship to Qaddafi. 
uh, obviously, he, he stood up against the oil companies. Uh, we've talked about these uh, funding of terrorists and so on. But, but then, on the other hand, uh, as the West's view of him changed, then he, he became an ally in the war on terrorism after 9-11. No, I don't know if any other leader has gone through such a zigzag trajectory as, uh, as Colonel Gaddafi, you know, who, who went from being, you know, Ronald Reagan called him this mad dog of the Middle East. And then you end up, um, you know, in 2003 with Tony Blair and the deal in the desert, you know, shaking mm. hands with him in his tent. And I think that Gaddafi actually played President Bush and uh, Prime Minister Tony Blair very cleverly. Because by then, he'd sort of done with the terrorism thing. He'd got over that phase. And he wanted to come in from the cold. And it was a question of my enemy's enemy is my friend. After 9-11, the people who were trying to overthrow him at that time, or the most, most forceful ones, were jihadists, were Islamists, some of whom were based in Afghanistan, and some of whom knew Osama bin Laden. And so he went to Blair and Bush and said, look, you know, these enemies, they're my enemies too. Let's work together. And um, that's exactly that's exactly what happened. And and Bush had an incentive to go along because this proved that the Iraq War worked. He thought. Well, that, that was about the weapons of mass destruction. And in fact, that you, because Gaddafi gave up his weapons of mass destruction, he had a chemical weapons facility, and he had. He had the kind of Lego parts for nuclear, but he hadn't put it all together. Um, President Bush and Blair said, oh, it was because of Iraq that he gave up this arsenal. That's not true. Mm -hmm. He had already approached the Clinton administration, and Martin Indyk, who was very senior in the Clinton administration, has, has written quite a lot about this, that actually Gaddafi had already sent out the feelers saying he was interested in, in getting rid of this arsenal and coming back in mm -hmm. the, into, the, you know, into the fold, as it were, long before the Iraq war. And it, it didn't quite happen for various reasons, but Gaddafi was the one who, who started that. And then Bush and Blair came on office and said, oh, it was because of, of Saddam Hussein in Iraq. I don't think that the facts bear that out. Uh, you, you talk about the, the bizarre family that was around Gaddafi, and, and as we're talking about the way the West dealt, the, the son, Saf, who was, uh, is that pronounced correctly? Safe. Safe. Uh, uh, was, uh, the one who tried to implement this. And, and in the course of doing that, he, he really corrupted uh, anybody he dealt with in the West. I'm thinking here of the London School of Economics. Well, you say Al Gaddafi is a really interesting character because, he, you know, he's not all bad. I, I think he was a genuine reformer. He, he, he had a different vision for Libya, and I think that he did want to make it a more open country. I don't think you can necessarily say that he wanted to make it more democratic because he wanted to inherit power, and there's nothing democratic about power passing from, from father to son in that way. But he did, you know, he tried to, to improve uh, human rights record and, and so on. But then, yeah, on the other hand, he, he had a tremendous sense of entitlement. And he went to the London School of Economics, and um, his English wasn't really good enough, and his level of study wasn't high enough. But pe some people there, particular professors, said, well, you know, he's a good influence in Libya. He's the one who might open it up to the West. And, you know, that was the time when Blair and Bush were doing deals uh, with the Libyans and so on. And so, you know, he snuck in, and he got into the LSE, and then... You know, the thesis, well, it wasn't that great. But then we found out later the thesis was actually um, written, how should I put this? It was a process of dictation. <laughs> that was how it was put, with the aid of somebody who was assigned to monitor group. A consulting group. Which is yeah. a consulting yeah. group, a, you know, a US based consulting group. So they, um, how should we put it? They assisted this particular student in the production of his PhD thesis, which is a uh, it's not the orthodox method of getting a PhD from the London School of Economics. And, and Saif was was caught in a rivalry with his uh, his, his brother, brother. Mutasim. Yeah. So so the 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 the, the Qaddafi structure becomes, you say, I think at some point a mafia, yeah. basically where the the uh, the uh, the underlings basically are going at each other. Well, that's right. I mean, there were various different uh, different sons, and also the daughter Aisha. Mutasim was really the hardliner who wanted to continue with the security state. And um, Saif was the one who, you know, wanted some opening up and reform. And Saadi was the one who wanted to play football. 
and he it's the most uh, we've never come across this before you know normally in Europe um, teams pay an enormous amount of money to get players well it's the only occasion I've ever heard of <laughs> Sadi could actually paid an Italian team so that he could play for them and he he also owned a football team and this I think gives you an example of why people hated the Sun so much Sadi owned a football team in Tripoli called Al Ahli and there was another football team in Benghazi, the second city, which was also called Al Ahli, Al Ahli Benghazi. So Saudi said, "No, no, no, you can't. You, that, that team can't exist. I'm going to destroy it." Mm. So you know, you do it the normal method, you know, buying off the players, bribing the referees, all that kind of thing. And eventually, the, the the fans in Benghazi went crazy. There was just one too many penalties awarded the wrong way, and they rioted. And they got a donkey, and they dressed the donkey in the colours of Al Ahli Tripoli and put Saadi's number as a player <laughs> on it and paraded it through the streets. What happened? Some of those people got arrested, they got tortured, and their clubhouse was bulldozed to the ground. Mm. Another thing, I'll just tell you one more thing about football, because it's very important in, in Libya. No other player was allowed to be known by his name. They were only known by their number, because nobody was allowed to become more famous than Saadi or Gaddafi himself. Mm -hmm. The, the next phase of your book, uh, and, and these, these different phases basically are, are throughout the book, so it's a dichotomy I'm creating for this, this interview, but the remarkable story of the revolution and, and the stories you tell about the people and how they came together. Now, one of the things that, that I found really fascinating was the return of emigres back to Libya. So once the revolution starts, pe Libyans who are living all over the world come back, professionals, to do their part in, in fighting Gaddafi. Yeah, this is one of the most interesting things because as you know, Libya declined, when Gaddafi first came to power, he built schools and hospitals and, and so on. Um, and he did expand educational opportunities. But then over time, that crumbled and nothing really worked. And, and you know, many Libyans are reasonably wealthy uh, because of the oil and gas wealth and so on. And so they would send their children overseas. And so, you know, it, in Britain, I discovered, and I didn't really know this before I went to Libya, that, you know, we have a large number of uh, Libyan doctors in our National Health Service. And when I was on my way out to Libya for the first time last February, when I was at, at the airport, three men came up to me and said, Oh, Lindsay. And I said, you know me? And they said, yes, we've seen you on the television. Are you going to Libya? I said, yes. And they said, so are we. We're volunteering for the revolution. And they were volunteering to work as doctors. And then I met another uh, young man, very interesting young man, who um, he had been in Seattle. And he had been in IT there. And he'd gone back to Libya a couple of years earlier. It was sort of mooching around, a kind of a bit of a lost rich kid. Mm. Um, and he had made friends with somebody very deep inside the, uh, inside the Gaddafi war machine. And he went in to an office every day and he spied. Mm. He spied for NATO. He was sending, uh, you know, through a coded way, he was sending out reports. For, and he was right there in the belly of the beast. Well, think about the kind of nerve that that takes. So, so it's really fascinating because these are uh, presumably educated professionals assimilated to the West, and yet the pull of the revolution uh, brings them back. I mean, it's a, it's a kind of a fascinating story, and this is in a country where the emphasis has been on tribe and family. So, I'm I'm trying to understand this. Yeah. Proof of Libyan nationalism. Yeah, no, that's a very interesting point because the Libyan nationalism is certainly there. And I mean, Huda Abu Zaid, who's one of the the people whose stories I, I chronicle, um, whose father was in the opposition and was was murdered. He was one of the stray dogs. You know, she hadn't been back since she was a child. But you know, the death of her father had haunted her all her life, and she went back to take part in the revolution. And she she said something to me. She said, you know. It's the first time in my life when I, you know, I get up and I go out and I listen on the streets and everybody speaks Arabic like my family do. And I've never been in that place before. She said all sorts of little things about my family, the quirks that they have and so on. Suddenly that's all normal. And whereas before we were always so different. So I think that for many Libyans there, there was this, you know, this tremendous sense of, of homecoming. But I would say that you know, when you look to the future, those Libyans who've been educated abroad, they don't want an Islamic state. 
they don't want a chaotic state. They don't want a state with no central government. So one of the critical issues is whether will those educated Libyans who are absolutely essential for rebuilding the country, will they stay? We don't know that yet. You, you say in the book that, that what the dynamic here was a, a sense of humiliation and shame that turned to anger. And, and this turn happens uh, in the, the regional context of the Arab Spring. And then it, 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 its, its power, in a way, comes from technology basically, as they learn about what's happening in, in Tunisia and Egypt, and then using technology in different ways to report uh, online about what's happening among the people. That's right. I mean, I think that there was this sense in Libya that Gaddafi, you know, Gaddafi had been there for so long, for 42 years, and their whole political system was atrophied, nothing moved. And yet, of course, you know, Libyans have moved on like everybody else. You know, they watch satellite television. They're totally aware of what's going on in the world. And, and once again, maybe like in the time of King Idris, they felt they were being left behind. And they did also feel humiliated that this man who was, who was something of a joke on the world stage was the one who was, was representing them. And then that technology, yes, they, as, in, as happened particularly in Egypt, it was used uh, very much for the revolution. And the first thing we knew about the revolution in Libya were, were you know, sort of grainy video which came out of statues of the Green Book, you know, Gaddafi's philosophy. Mm -hmm. He had these really incredibly ugly concrete statues in every major town. So we had these pictures of those statues being destroyed by young men with hammers and pickaxes. And uh, in the book, I, I, I met the young man who was responsible for those first photographs. He, he filmed it, locked himself in the internet cafe in Tobruk in the Far East, and put those pictures out so that the rest of the world would know what was going on. More than that, he put his phone number and his name, and he said, anybody who's interested in revolution in Libya, call, call me. me. Yeah. So we did. <laughs> that, he was our first contact. And, and uh, it, you, you point out, you mentioned the, the young man from Seattle who became a spy, but it, it's almost like everybody came back with their skills to find a niche in the revolution. And, and there's one fascinating story of essentially pranksters, I mean, it's almost out of the 60s, who, who would uh, leave recordings in trash bins. T tell no, us no, about this, is, this was a, a group of young people who were mostly cousins and brothers mm -hmm. and sisters, and they founded something called the Free Generation Movement. And uh, one of them, Nizar, is an oral surgeon in Wales. And Mervat, his sister, um, she had also been brought up in Britain, but was now living back in, she had married and gone back to, to Tripoli. And uh, they didn't want to pick up a gun, but they didn't want Gaddafi said everybody in Tripoli was with him, and they didn't want that to stand. They said that wasn't true. So they started this campaign of, of civil disobedience. And one of my, my favorite things that they did was exactly that, that they basically recorded the revolutionary anthem on these sound systems, which they put out in the trash on the day that everybody puts their trash out in, in black plastic bags. And then they drove off. And Mervat filmed this. That's another thing that took nerve. And so suddenly the trash starts to sing the revolutionary <laughs> anthem. And everybody going past is going, what, what, what the hell is going on? And uh, I thought that that was, a, that was a sort of brilliantly imaginative way of making that point. You, you talk about the horror of horrors, which is the, the massacre at the Abu Salam prison, 1996. Tell us what happened and then how it was affected the people who thought their relatives had survived. Well, Gaddafi would lock up his opponents, and um, many of them were put in this prison called Abu Salim in Tripoli. And the conditions were terrible. People died of TB and starvation. And in 1996, some of the prisoners, who were mainly the Islamists, rioted, and they took hostage two guards, one of whom they killed. And uh, Sanusi, uh, Gaddafi's brother-in-law, went in to negotiate with them. And they thought they had a deal, that they were going to get better treatment and, uh, you know, and clothes and food and so on. But in fact, what happened was that they were herded into a courtyard and uh, soldiers were placed on the roof all around and they gunned these people down. So in the space of four hours from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. on the 28th of June 1996, the soldiers killed 1,270 men. 
And I, I think that this book is the first full account of that massacre. I don't think that the full account has been told before, because I had two eyewitnesses. One of them, Wanisa Lasawi, who was in another cell, who could see through the slit in, in the cell, he said he saw the walls of that courtyard turn red with blood. Mm. But, you know, they didn't, they never, they never admitted to anything. Um, I realized when I got to Benghazi that, um, that this, this was a central incident. You kill that many men, it touches a lot of people. We're talking about a small population, so many, many families were, were affected by Abu Salim. Um, and I asked to meet some of the families, and I, I went into a room, and uh, there were about 15, 20 women on one side, the same number of men on the other, and each of them was holding up a photograph of the son or brother or father who they had lost. And they were silent. It was a very, uh, it, was, it was a chilling moment. And then a, an old man came forward wearing sort of dark red fez and big glasses, and he said, it was my brother-in-law. Um, my sister's husband was in the prison, and uh, every couple of months we would travel 600 miles to Tripoli, and we would take food and clothing for him, and we were told to leave it at the gate. We couldn't go in and see him. And he said, we did that for 14 years before they told us he was dead. Mm. How, how, can you, how can you do that? How can you leave families living in hope when their relatives have been long dead in an anonymous grave? That was the signature atrocity of the Gaddafi regime. And, and so somehow in, in the revolution, and, and we don't know what's going to happen now that the revolution has succeeded, all of these memories, the technology, the return of, of the emigres sort of all came together. And, and you, you described the moment you were present when it was realized that the revolution had succeeded. Talk about that. When, well, you mean in Tripoli, when yeah, Tripoli yeah. finally fell. Yes, no, it was extraordinary. I was in the Nafusa Mountains, um, which are west of, of Tripoli at that point, and I was coming in with, with rebels from there. And, um, and so we came hurtling in. And, you know, it was the most, it was one of those, it's one of those days you go into journalism for, mm -hmm. to be there at that extraordinary mm -hmm. moment. And then what I will never forget is hurtling up the road with these rebels, and there was this old man. And he was, he was at the side of the road, and he, he had his arms up, and he was shouting, shouting, these are all my sons. These are all my sons. And then he, he knelt down on the pavement, and he, he thanked God like this. And he said, this is my country. These are my people. These are all my sons. And I, that was just an extraordinary moment. And, the, you know, people, it was a moment of extreme hope. Shortly after that, we were shot at. You know, there was still fighting, mm -hmm. fighting going on. But there was that sense that they, they had done it. At last, they had done it. And, and so it, it's almost uh, the, it's that moment of freedom mm. after oppression. But that does not tell us what's going to follow. It doesn't. And it doesn't do to be dewy-eyed no. about a revolution. And, you know, the rebels, um, some pretty terrible things have happened. There's appalling racism in Libya. Um, Gaddafi uh, favored or got loyalty from darker skinned people, um, more African people, the Tuareg to the south, a people called the Tuwarga, who are a small uh, number of people who he built a town for them just outside the port of Misrata, and they were all black. And um, he armed them, and they were very important in fighting the rebels. And um, the rebels, uh, the rebels say that these Tuwarga men committed many atrocities. That's what they say. And so when it was over and the rebels had won, they burnt that place to the ground. And many Tuwarga men have been captured and are being held and have been tortured. And the women and children have all been driven out and are now living as refugees in their own country. Um, Gaddafi also employed mercenaries from other parts of Africa. And there are many Africans who work in Libya doing sort of menial jobs. And, but now any black person is suspect. And um, Human Rights Watch thinks that between five and 8,000 people are being held prisoner by the different militia. And some of them have been extremely badly treated. And then you've got, you, you know, everybody, Libya, it's like year zero. Because there was no state, you've got a void. 
And so all these different groups are rushing in, and the young men don't want to put their weapons down, and they think that the way to get what they want for, for their clan or their tribe or their town is to fight for it. And so, you know, you, you, one young woman said to me, you know, the real problem is that each of us has got a little Gaddafi in our heads. Mm -hmm. And that's what it is, the psychological legacy, that people have no tradition of compromise and negotiation. They want it, they'll fight for it. It's almost as if uh, the moment that you have captured is, you know, the, the, the moment when Libya can be, but then what follows, it's not clear that Libya will continue to survive. In a way. Well, I, I, the whole I, thing may fall apart. It could fall apart. I do think that, that there is a sense of, of Libyanness which will keep the country um, together as a country. But I think that they have a right, very rocky path ahead because there is no tradition of democracy, and yet it's only through some kind of democratic legitimacy, and they're trying to do that, move towards elections and so on, that any kind of law or order or government can, can be established. And what I hope that the book does is, it, you know, it chronicles the revolution in the Gaddafi years and provides, I mean, it's not a textbook, it's a journalistic book, but it, it provides, I hope, um, an account of that that will stand, that will stand the test of time and that will help us understand what happens next. Because I've tried to, you know, look at all of these, these conflicts and, and schisms within Libyan society between secularists and Islamists, between men and women, between East and West, so that we can, we at least have some tools for understanding what now happens. Uh, why do you think the West intervened? Because this was all happening among the people. It was a Libyan revolution, but the key to the success of the revolution was Western in intervention. And, and this really relates to regional politics, which you discuss very well. Yeah, I think that there's two things here. I think, um, first of all, why did they intervene? Because the rebels were losing. I mean, the rebels were very inexperienced fighters, particularly on the Eastern Front. And uh, you know, they were doctors and lawyers. They'd never picked up a weapon before. And uh, they were being pushed back down the road towards Benghazi by Gaddafi's forces. And Gaddafi said that he would hunt his opponents down, zenga, zenga. Alleyway by alleyway. And that speech was very important. It was for very important. And, and I don't think anybody had any doubt that he meant it. Um, and basically, they were losing. And I think that there was a genuine concern in Western capitals that we were going to see another Srebrenica or Rwanda, that we would see slaughter in Benghazi. And uh, I was there, and I was pretty scared. But they intervened to protect civilians. That was what it said in the Security Council mandate. And then the French bombed a... Um, a convoy of tanks just outside uh, Benghazi, and that basically reversed the tide of war. But, you know, then the mandate was stretched, and it was stretched to regime change. And there's no doubt that they were trying to get rid of Gaddafi. He didn't have many friends left. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Arab Union uh, wanted to get rid of the Arab League, wanted to get rid of him, sorry. And, and um, you know, because he had this really annoying habit of trying to assassinate other Arab leaders, and, you know, <laughs> it just doesn't go down well. The African Union still supported him to some extent, but the Arab League didn't. And, um, but, you know, the Russians who had agreed, I mean, they didn't veto that UN Security Council resolution, but they accepted it, it they say, because they said it, they thought it was about protecting civilians. And when it turned to regime change, which they see as an attack on sovereignty, um, they were pretty annoyed. And so they, you know, the Russian attitude is we're not going to get fooled again. And so I don't think we're going to see that kind of intervention again, not in Syria or anywhere else, because the Russians will not allow it. And, and the emir of Qatar was very important here. Explain the, that. The, the role of Qatar is very interesting, <clears throat> and I have to say that I don't fully understand it. It's this tiny country, 350,000 people, the wealthiest country in the world. The sheikh there is somewhat liberal. You know, we have Al Jazeera um, television channel, which is so influential in the Arab world and elsewhere in the world, both the English-speaking channel and the Arabic-speaking channel. Um, but he, and he has sheltered, you know, these are the contrasts in Qatar, that they opened up relations with Israel, but they've also provided an office for Hamas. And, you know, also offered to for the Taliban. So they see themselves as a sort of bridge between Western nations and the Arab world. And there were Libyans there who got a lot of support from Qatar. Now, the Qatar has provided a lot of weapons for the rebels in general, but in particular, they provided weapons 
for Islamist brigades, brigades which were connected with the Muslim Brotherhood. And this is something which is very contentious in Libya now, because some people in Libya say, well, thank you very much, Qatar, for those weapons when we need it. Would you like to go away now, because we don't want interference in our country? And other people, of course, say, thank you very much, Qatar, and yes, please, can we have a little bit more money? Uh, <clears throat> there's an important element to the story that you tell, which is this, this gentleman, Sami, who essentially who, who went to uh, uh, an Islamic fighter, <clears throat> excuse me, who went to Afghanistan but refused to join al Qaeda yeah. and came back. So there is a, a fundamentalism attached to Libyan nationalism that is not part of the global jihad. It's, it's, it's a quite complicated issue, but basically you had the Libyan Islamic <clears throat> fighting group. And, uh, and they were Islamists, they were jihadis. Uh, so they believed in violence as the only way of changing things, and they believed in a division in the world. I mean, we may make a, a distinction between um, civilians and soldiers. They don't make that div d distinction for them. Mm. It's just Muslims and non-Muslims. So they're definitely jihadis. Um, and they fought, uh, first of all, they fought against the Soviets in Afghanistan. And then they went back and uh, formed this group to overthrow Gaddafi. And they knew Osama bin Laden. Uh, Sami al Saadi, whose story I have, um, met bin Laden, I think, five times. But they were never interested in any kind of jihad against the West. They were only interested in jihad against Gaddafi. And they say that, and, and that's what other people say, too. It's not just them telling me that. There's quite a lot of evidence to back that up. Um, but, you know, then what, what happens is that you get 9-11, you get Gaddafi saying, um, you know, these people who are fighting me, they're jihadis. And so then you get back to the, the Bush and Blair thing and Sami al Saadi, um, who uh, had fled Afghanistan, ends up in Hong Kong and um, is a subject of extraordinary rendition. The CIA and MI6 basically collaborated in his kidnap to send him back to Libya and he was put back in prison and tortured. We're now confronting the problem of Syria, and, and we get back to this problem of intervention. Uh, and journalists such as yourself do this important task of documenting the horrors of these regimes that are turning against their own people. Uh, and But then the real politic of the situation uh, works against any kind of information. What, 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 what's the dilemma here that, that we have to learn to deal with? Well, I think there's two dilemmas. The first dilemma for journalists is the danger mm. of reporting from Syria. And, um, you know, my, my friend Marie Colvin was, was killed reporting from Syria. And her, her last article in the Sunday Times is, a, is an absolute model of, of war reporting where she describes the widow's basement in Homs, where the women who've lost their husbands sit with their children as the shells come in. And this is the Bashar al-Assad government, which is, is shelling the civilians. And so, you know, that's the first dilemma, how do we report? And then the second dilemma is the whole issue of intervention, because, because Libya was to some extent a simple conflict. Uh, Libyans are pretty much all Sunni Muslims. Uh, militarily, it was quite simple. All the fighting took place on this northern uh, road, this coastal strip, whereas the rest is, is desert. Gaddafi didn't have many friends left in the world. Um, Syria is so much more complex that Bashar al-Assad represents a minority, a sectarian minority, the Alawites, who are connected to the Shias in Iran. And he also, um, to some extent, represents Christians. And the majority of the people are Sunni Muslims. And so what's happening is that you've got Iran and Russia backing Bashar al-Assad. You've got Qatar and Saudi Arabia backing the, the rebels who are Sunnis. So this is shaping up to be a, a regional conflagration. This is shaping up to be the place where the Shias and the Sunnis fight each other, which, of course, you know, could be devastation uh, across the region. And so intervening is a much more complex thing and could have many more unintended consequences. But the unintended consequences of not intervening is that we're seeing children being massacred. It's an unbearable problem. Do, do you have any uh, thought uh, of how the, the stories coming out of Syria from the journalists and the images can be used to change policy short of intervention? 
basically that that in other words does it does there have to be military intervention to stop the killing is 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 diplomacy absolutely useless i wouldn't ever say that diplomacy was completely useless but certainly at, at this time as we talk diplomacy has failed and that Kofi Annan's plan to try and get a ceasefire and so on it hasn't worked but you know it, it doesn't mean the military intervention would work either military intervention might make the situation worse what, what advice would you give <coughs> students who, that, who listen to this uh, interview or read your book and want to do this kind of work be careful <laughs> um, I would say if you want to be a journalist that's a great thing um, but I would not advise going to a hot war zone first of all I would um, advise going somewhere you know if you're going to go out there into the into the world go to find a place that's interesting but which is on the edge of a, of a big story and sort of get hone your skills and get your contacts and, and so on and I would also say that anybody going into one of these kind of conflicts should do a hostile environments course. You know, I, I, I've done several of these courses now. When I first went into war zones, I didn't know anything. I couldn't recognize any weapons. I mean, gosh, I mean, I, you know, it's, I, I, I'm terrified when I look back at my younger self. But now I've done the, these courses and I've, you know, I've learned something about, you know, how to judge between incoming and outgoing fire and, uh, you know, and, and, and just sort of being aware of your, your situation. Um, and, you know, these days we wear flak jackets and helmets. We didn't used to do that in the old days. But I, the other thing is, you know, Libya was, Libya was a very accessible conflict. And so there were a lot of kids up there on the front line and careers have been made and they, did, they were fantastically brave and they did brilliant journalism. But three of three of my colleagues were killed. This is the price which is paid. What what has the Libyan experience and the writing of the book taught you? Oh, what a good question! <clears throat> it's taught me. It's taught me um, how how the human story is the centre of what I do, and that learning about people and people's experiences is the most fascinating thing that the policy is in there and I'm interested in the policy and I'm interested in how the world works but it comes down in the end to what people go through and you know as feminists we always used to say um, the personal is political and I think through this book I've understood more than ever that the political is personal that what Gaddafi did to Libya it, it changed lives it ruined lives it altered relationships between families it destroyed destroyed trust all of these things so it all comes back to the to the human experience I suppose the other things thing I've learned is that you know when you write a book you 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 get to understand in so much more depth I mean this conversation we're having now it's fantastic and I'm coming it's all the themes and so on are there but in the book I'm able to say so much more and, and this story is going to repeat itself, isn't it? Because what we're witnessing, <clears throat> especially in the Middle East, is a, a struggle for human dignity. It's a struggle for human dignity, and it's a struggle for, for the, the perception and the concept of human dignity. Because I think that it's quite likely that these countries, Egypt, Tunisia, uh, Libya, will go through an Islamist phase. I think that it's, if you have democracy, I think a large number of people are going to vote for Islamists. Now, they would say that that is human dignity. But secularists in Libya would say that that is an assault on their dignity. Mm -hmm. So I think that, we're sh that this, is going to be, this is going to be the dilemma and the conflict of the coming decades. Lindsay, let me show your book again to our audience and recommend it because in an hour conversation, you, we can only touch a few of the, the best parts. So uh, I recommend it very highly. And I want to thank you very much for coming on our program. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history. Thank you.